I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And I'm Lori. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, Isaiah 58 to 66. And we have our friend Lori with us. She works with the church and she is in charge of helping to train the Seminary Institute teachers globally. So it's really valuable to have her with us today. Thank you so much. I, I guess her, her bigger qualifications might be that she loves the Lord and she's a connoisseur of chocolate milk. Valid. Apparently. There you go. So, Lori Newbold, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you join us today. And as we get ready to jump into our fifth episode of Isaiah, which to us is a real treat, uh, what, what would you say to somebody who out there might be saying, ah, I've, we've done a lot of Isaiah, I'm ready to move on? What yeah. would you say? No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the ways that I've approached, I've, I've told both of them in this experience, I am not your Isaiah scholar, but I do love Jesus Christ, and I have uh, gotten better as time has gone out finding him. So to me, what I'd say about Isaiah is what Nephi said. Uh, to kind of start in 2 Nephi chapter 11, um, he has this really sweet blip in, in the verse of how he, in verse 2, uh, describes, he says, Now I, I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. And I can tell you there's been times in my life I wouldn't have said that because I felt like it was really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I stuck with it because I do think that the language and all that can be tough. So if you struggled, that's okay. I actually think you're really normal. Um, but this next line to me is, is really significant. I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children, for verily he saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And one of the questions that I've asked myself is, um, how did studying the words of Isaiah help Nephi bear testimony that Jesus Christ is my Redeemer. Um, there's another spot at the end of Nephi, 2 Nephi in verse 30, in 33, verse 6, where he says, I glory in my Jesus. And sometimes in our conversation, we talk about the Redeemer or the Savior. And I think there's a lot of power as you seek to not talk about the, which is a good place to start, but he wants to be, he wants us to possess him my Savior, my Redeemer, and I, I can just witness and hope that maybe we'll talk about some of that day as we kind of go through. You'll be able to see Jesus Christ in a way that helps you be even more possessive of him um, as that part of it. So I just love my Redeemer, uh, and I witness that as I start today, I hope that's okay, but I just want you to know that I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's my friend. He's my physician, and um and uh, I, I just pray that that can be, you know, part of what we do today, because I love that Nephi does it so well and teaches us so well. <laughs> I love, Lori, the way you've introduced this. Just to remind ourselves, why are we reading ancient prophets? It's for this reason that we can know Jesus, that he is our Redeemer, my Redeemer, my Savior. And I bear witness, like Lori has, I know that Jesus is my Redeemer. I have felt his saving power in my life. Which, by the way, we, we do this with, with our hymn book you'd even mentioned earlier. What a difference it would make if our song, our beloved hymn number 136 was, I know that the Redeemer lives. It, it would be less powerful than how we sing it. I know that my Redeemer lives. So basically using that as an overlay as we jump into chapter 58, the 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 learning technique here is look for your Redeemer on every page, in every part of these chapters. And by the way, the Lord doesn't have any problem at all using the possessive pronouns when referring to us. He refers to us as his people, my people. And so it's this reflexive uh, relationship that we're uh, giving in return of making him our Redeemer. It's pretty pretty uh, powerful. So, should we jump in? Chapter 58? A lot to talk about. Uh, if, you were to, if you were to summarize chapter 58 
in, in a quick overview setting, it's going to cover two um, topics of what we consider to be our, our religion today, is fasting and Sabbath observance. But it comes to us through the lenses of Isaiah, and he's going to approach it in such a beautiful way and, and make these the, he, he's going to set up these topics in such a way that we can see them more clearly from heaven's perspective. What is fasting all about? And what is the Sabbath observance all about from, from heaven's perspective? It's beautiful. So let's jump in. Chapter 58, verse 1 starts, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, or transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Did you notice all four of those verbs? Cry, spare not, lift up, and show. Hmm, that sounds like what a prophet is supposed to do. That sounds like what a leader in, in the church and kingdom of God is supposed to do. That sounds like what a parent or a true friend should do, is cry aloud, spare not, lift up the voice, and show my people. Um, what is it that they were showing them? Verse 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Well, it's helped me, especially with Isaiah, is the footnotes. So that very first one, they do all the rituals but lack something yet. Oh, that's what he means, because it seems like seeking me daily would be a positive thing, and then he explains a little language-wise what that is, so. Yeah, and he's just trying to encourage people to update their practices and be a little more grounded in why they should be fasting. Uh, let's remind our, all of ourselves what fasting is, the word itself, fast. Like, if you talk about a fast runner, somebody who's quick or strong, and fast does mean strong. Like, if you have a fastener to fasten a board into a wall, you're going to make it stick and hold firm. So to fast means to get strong, to get stronger in the Lord. And we see the things that they have been doing, like in verse 3, 4, and 5, they've been fasting, but for the wrong reasons. Like verse 4, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Seems strange. Like fasting's hard already, but I can't imagine like, I'm going to fast just so I can have more debate with people and to get into fisticuffs. And apparently, people were having some kind of conflict or debate or fights around the purpose of fasting, that Isaiah has got to correct them. And he finally tells us in verse 7, the purpose of fasting, uh, verse 6 and 7, is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Very, very powerful. And if we think about fasting today, we understand those purposes. But in Isaiah's day, apparently, people had misunderstood or at some point forgotten why they should be fasting. And they made it a point of conflict instead of the intention is to liberate people, to help people experience God's liberty. So if you look at this from a, from a step back perspective, you have the godly and then you have the, uh, let's just say, the worldly ways of doing things. So you'll notice how this whole discussion of fasting started. You're, you're doing the right things, but it's kind of like you're just going through the motions. You're, you may not be doing them for the right reason. And you could plug this into all kinds of concepts. Uh, sorrow. There's godly sorrow, and then there's worldly sorrow. You, you can go through the motions of being sad because of things that have happened or that you've done wrong, but it may or may not lead you to become more like the Savior through the process. It's godly sorrow that does that. Same thing with fasting. You can do all of the elements, the physical elements of a fast, and check all of the boxes from a world's perspective of, oh, yep, that's a fast, but not have it actually help connect you with, with heaven anymore or bring you closer to God. So, as, as we've said, if you were to mark off verse 3 through 5, that's a worldly fast. Th those are things you're going through the motions, you're, you're denying yourself of the food and the water, 
but it's not for the right reasons. And so it's probably not going to help you in the end, but if you do 6 through 12, that's a heavenly, a, a godly approach to fasting, and it unlocks all kinds of power in that fast for us to, to deal thy bread on the hungry, bring the poor that are cast out to thy, of thy house, clothing the naked, all of these things that we covenanted to do at baptism. And if I can make a comment to that, I, um, I am all in for this for sure. I also love, sometimes I think in gospel principles, President Oaks talk on good, better, best. So um, if you're fasting surely for obedience, it's a good reason to fast. You know you're supposed to, it's fast Sunday, because as we talked about, you mentioned in verse 4, the strife and debate, and, and again, footnotes. P.S. This is how I start Isaiah. I start with the footnotes, and I highlight every footnote that gives me the meaning in the uh, in the biblical language or in other words or any JST, because that helps clarify for me. So just that's a fun fact of my learning experience. So, um, so in four, it, it even mentions fasting without spiritual motivation only engenders discomfort and irritability. I think that that was the first, I don't know, 20 years of my fasting experience, probably growing up. And I actually think it's really normal. And I, if you do that, that, that's okay. What I see is an invitation for the Lord here to take his people um, from good to better, and then from better to best when it comes to fasting. And he says, so can I tell you why? Can I tell you what it will do for you? And I love, I love in verse six, um, <laughs> it's hard for me to not be a little emotional about these verses because I've seen the power in my own life to loose the bands of wickedness. Well, what wickedness do I have in my life that is tight on me? Um, to, undo, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. When I think about, when I put those phrases in my own life, um, I, can, I can witness that, that fasting has, um, because it focuses my thoughts to Jesus Christ, and because he is the, he's the, I mean, think about it, when you use the phrase, let the oppressed go free, that is what Jesus Christ does. He frees the oppressed. That's why he's a redeemer. That's where that, one of the reasons that title. So it's fun to go through and connect each of these promises with the title of the Savior that makes sense of why this helps us come to him and then also come why it comes from him because he wants this relationship with us. And he's, to me, fasting is an invitation. And can I give you something that will help you know me better and love me more? And um, anyway, I just... There was a, one of my favorite articles on this is by Elder Shane Bowen, and it's in the April 2009 um, Enzyme. Now we look at Leon or whatever. But he, the very first line, what if there were a way to overcome our habits, addictions, and burdens? Well, you had me there <laughs> because, yes, right? And then you go through, what if there were a way to gain sufficient confidence in the Lord that you could call down the powers of heaven? What if there were principles you could teach your loved ones that, if applied, would allow them to overcome personal weakness and draw closer to God? And then he lays out Isaiah 58, 6. Proper, and then he says, proper and consistent fasting can help us overcome sins, bad habits, and addictions. Is there any of us who would not want to be freed from the personal burdens that we carry? So I, anyway, I just, when you look at this too, again, it reminds me of like, well, how am I freed? I'm not freed. Fasting doesn't free me. Jesus Christ frees me. But this takes me to him in my intent and in my heart and in my prayers. And, uh, and in a good, better, best way, my ability to fast has grown significantly. Because uh, uh, I think it's one of those like whew, principles, you know? What a powerful example from Elder Bowen. Lori, thank you for sharing that. It's, in my mind, it's, it's a way that God has given us to become more like him. And so, I'm really like, uh, how is fasting doing that? Stop and think about that for a minute. You take that which is, which is heavenly compared to that which is earthly, and you and I are dual-natured beings. 
there's part of me and part of you that actually was up in heaven, that lived in the royal courts on high, and there's part of me standing here that was not up in heaven, that's part of this earth. So we have this combination of the, the divine attributes of our soul and the earthly attributes of our soul, and those two elements are now together, and they have to learn how to get along in mortal life. And isn't it fascinating that when we fast, it's as if the, the mortal part, the, the physical part of our being, is constantly making physical demands of the spiritual part of our being, and if we're not careful, before long it becomes this kind of relationship where the, the body is saying, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, all those things that, that apply to the physical nature, and the spirit, if we're not careful, can end up being subservient. Isn't it amazing that once a month the Lord gives us this invitation um, to have the scenario of, I'm hungry, and the spirit be able to say, good, and the body say, what do you mean, feed me? Not yet. <laughs> And by the time that 24 hours is over, you get this kind of a relationship where the spirit isn't adversarial. It's not saying, I hate you, the flesh is evil, it's bad. It's, no, I like you. I'm going to be with you in the eternities in a, in a resurrected sense, but for here, I need you to know I'm in charge. I'm calling the shots here. Hence the power of this talk from Elder Bowen of freeing the captive, of allowing your, your spirit to rule over that which is, is just the, the earthly and keep it in a proper relationship. And I, to what you're saying, I, um, I think there was a couple of things that you mentioned that kind of stood out to me. One is um, I, I had a, a sister in my 20s who said to me one time, and this was legitimately the first time somebody mentioned it to me, she said, um, Every time I get hungry, I pray. And that is she goes, I pray for whatever I'm fasting for. And that shifted my fasting experience because it was just misery in a lot of ways as a teenager. And and I don't think I'm alone in saying, like, I love food. And it's odd as many like gospel commands have been hard to live in some ways. This is one of what has been one of the hardest for me. And then when she did that for me, I was like, oh yeah. So then I began to pray, and I still had hunger pangs, but all of a sudden I did have purpose. Um, and I knew I had purpose when I had started, but like this was the, the moment of like a reminder of my purpose and helped me. And I did think often, no, no, Heavenly Father, I really do want this, whatever this is, more than I want food. I also am aware of people who have felt shame because their physical uh, conditions have not allowed them to maybe fast the 24 hour, or whatever. But I think if you think about um, the principles behind fasting more than the actual behavior itself. If you do have to take pills and if you do have to, you know, have a, things, there are still ways to fast. And the question is, where's your heart? And, and what's your purpose? Are you focusing on the Savior? Are you giving an invitation um, to your point of, of somewhat of overcoming the natural man in some way? And then, and then am I Am I seeking this for what God intends it to be? And these will help, and these blessings can come. No matter what your physical capacity and your space is, you do what you can do, and you will know from God that it is right. I've had different relationships with fasting, and I have felt this move, and I love it now, not because I don't love food, and it is still physically miserable a lot of days, but I love what um, I know I can testify of what God has done for me, for my family, for people that I've worked with in every single one of these categories. I have watched him break addiction through fasting. And it's been even food addiction, which is feels like the cruelest irony. You struggle with food addiction and the Lord says, I want you to fast more. And you're like, really? This is brutal. But I've seen him do it. I don't know. It's powerful. So, as we now um, get ready for verse 8 through 12, just really quick overview. Remember that in verse 3 through 5, you get the non-example of, of 
how to fast or how not to fast, the worldly way of doing it, then 6 through 7 was the the true fast, what God has ordained. It wasn't the Lord isn't up in heaven saying, what can I do to make them miserable? I know, I'll tell them to fast. It's, it's supposed to be this joyful thing from his perspective, and, and that comes out very clearly in 6 and 7 in contrast to 3 through 5. And then what you get is 8 through 12, you're going to have all of the consequences, the positive outcomes from a good fast you'll notice that it starts in verse 8 with the word then. You'll see the word then in verse 9. You'll see an if-then in verse 10. The Lord is constantly doing this in Scripture where he'll set up these conditions. If you do this, then this will happen. Well, in this case, he puts it on a silver platter for us and says, look, you have no promise. If you're doing the world kind of fast, these spiritual promises aren't going to flow, but if you do it the way it's described in verse 6 and 7, then all of these things are going to come. So, you'll notice verse 8, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. You, You notice the power of activating your spirit in all of these uh, instances of being able to more fully commune and communicate with heaven. And then verse 10, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. Now you get introduced to this idea of not just what you're doing for yourself, but taking the fast and turning it into offerings as well to the poor, to the sick, the afflicted, the needy. Um, I've mentioned this before in the past, this insight that I learned from Wayne Dimmock, a dear friend and colleague from the past, where he sees fast offerings as one of those many invitations that the Lord gives us to become more Christ-like. Why? Because fast offering is an opportunity to take some of what we have as rich, give some of it away to the poor to help the poor become a little richer. Jesus, the richest of all, gave everything to us, the poorest of all, to make us become rich with him, a joint heir. So next time, next time Fast Sunday comes around and you're debating, should I give a fast offering, brothers and sisters, it's not about the money. It's about an invitation for you to become a little bit more like the Savior. Give up a little bit of what you've been given from heaven to help those who are in need fill of God's love, to fill a hug from heaven, so to speak, and and become a little richer. It's a powerful invitation. Can I, I think that is a beautiful description of that. Um, I've heard and I've I've had, there's many different talks or opinions about how much a fast offering should be. And um, I I like what you said, like, I, I don't know, <laughs> right? There's, I've heard everything from, well, I'm not even telling you what I've heard because I can't back any of it up with like what God has said other than if, if it's an offering, then, then I get to sit down with the Lord and say, what can I offer? And one of my favorite balancing principles in this, because again, even for some of you, those those offerings will will fluctuate depending on your financial situation of how many kids are at home or um, how many, you know, what stage of jobs or I mean, there's just so much uh, space in there. And one of my most favorite principles in this moment, which carries across many, is actually in Mosiah 4. Um this is King Benjamin's address, and he says in verse 24, again, I say unto the poor, ye who have not and yet have sufficient, that you may remain from day to day. I mean, all you who deny the beggar because you have not. I would that you say in your hearts that I give not because I have not, but if I had, I would give. And I think at the end of the day, you decide with the Lord what that is as you fast it may change from month to month, it may go at different times, but the reality is 
can you think about where you're at and what you can offer to the Lord? And that offering uh, connected with a widow's might, right? All of those offerings, we do that with tithing often. I don't know if we do it with fast offerings as much when we connect that. Because um, to your point, Heavenly Father created money. He knows where all, this is his earth that created gold. He knows where <laughs> all the money is in the whole entire world. So it's never about money to him, ever. It's always about hearts. And it's about entering into this relationship with the two great commandments. I want to show you, Father, that I love you. And I want to show your children that I love them. And, uh, and again, I've seen so many beneficiaries from fast offerings. But I just love the space that no matter where you're at, where's your heart? I give because I have. But even if I didn't have, then I would give. So where are you in that space? And that's the invitation, I think, on your end to decide what can I give and what can I do? Because this is about me learning to love and give like the Savior. So I think that's just a fun kind of principle to go with that. The other really fun invitation as you go through the promises in 8 through 12 that we just talked about of um, can you see, in fact, maybe can I do this with you really quick? <laughs> with, but with both of you, we're going to practice what we started with. Okay, so in 8 through 12, you see many references to the Lord and Him establishing who He is in the promise. So let me ask you this question. What do you learn about Jesus Christ in verses 8 through 12 that helps you say, He's my Redeemer? And it doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It can just be simple, but what do you... I like the phrase right here in verse 8. The light break forth as the morning. I have felt my life filled with light as I've accepted Jesus in my life, as I have sought his hand in my life, I have felt more light breaking into my life as the morning sun rising. And he is the light of light of the world. It all emanates from him. Which that's a fun title to connect right there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just off the, and how many of us have felt darkness? Right. So you're witness of him right there just from that one verse. But it doesn't say that there. So, I mean, like, that's what's cool. You just pulled from what he does to know who he is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love it. One of the other amazing things along this line, if you look at verse 9, is how the Lord responds to us when, when it's, then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. I love that, that he's modeling for us what he wants us to do with him. When we call to him, he's saying, when you're fasting, when you're doing this appropriately, when you call, I'm here, and I will say, here am I. Well, the reverse is an opportunity for me to become more like him when he calls to me, for me not to ignore him or reject him, but for me to respond exactly the way he responds to us and answer with, here am I, Lord. What do you want me to do? I'll do what you want me to do. So, if you were to boil it down to one sentence, you learn what about him? I learn that he listens and he responds and he loves and he's powerful and he wants me to listen, respond, and love. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share with you mine really quick. One of them, uh, as I went through again, thinking about this, was in, in, in verse 8, the glory of the Lord shall be thy rear word. Again, rear word, not my most common term. Looked it up, rear guard not my most common turn, but I get the idea that he comes behind me and supports me. In modern parlance, we'd say, he's got your back, he's got your six. Yes. I mean, if Isaiah was talking today, he says, God's got your six, he's got your back. <laughs> well, I think for me that that space is so significant because I love to think about him going before me and, and um, preparing a way. So when I get to that way, now I need to know that I'm not, uh, he's, He's got me behind and in front. He spaced it, and then in the middle, he's going to, I don't know how he does it, but he does it, right? He prepares the way, he walks with me, and then he supports me, and he's got my back. And I just, I love that witness that comes here of who he is as we read this about fasting. It's about him and that relationship, and, uh, and I just love him. So I'll pause there. So now let's shift into the, the second concept that he addresses here in chapter 58, which is the Sabbath day. And you'll notice how Isaiah does it. He does it with an if-then in two verses. You get the if in verse 13 and the then in verse 14. 
to start these off. Now, to set the stage, you'll notice it's it kind of comes down to two things. The worldly aspect of my will versus the heavenly aspect of thy will. This is kind of how he, he couches this discussion, and by the way, it applies to every principle of the gospel, not just Sabbath observance, not just fasting. It applies to every principle that you could ever discuss in any gospel setting is, am I going to do what I want to do from a worldly flesh-only perspective, or am I going to do what God wants me to do? So look at how he introduces it in verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. A three-peat here of thine, thine, thine. My will, where he's speaking to us. We live in a world that, that looks at the weekend and says, huh, Sunday is a day of rest from, from work, but it's a day of my pleasure, my delights, my own words, my own pursuits, rather than saying, what would thou have me do? What could I do to focus more on thee for this one day? Look at verse 14, the response is, if we will do this, focus on him and on his will, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And with the Lord Jesus Christ as our perfect exemplar, he, he shows us, he doesn't just teach the principles, he showed us how to live them. The Sabbath was a delight for him. It wasn't something to be dreaded or something where you, you sit moping around for a day saying, oh, I can't do anything fun today. It's, this is when you're out serving, healing, blessing, ministering to the needs. Jesus is consistently doing that on the Sabbath, and it, it gets him into some trouble with the, the way that some of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees of his day interpret the law. But I think he showed us a perfect example. This is where you're liberating the captive. Setting, setting people free th through those ministering efforts, which I think is God's will. He sent us down here to learn how to, how to do this. Um, if I can make one thing, too, that's helped me here, um, you know, a couple of years ago, the brethren had a very strong focus inviting us to improve our Sabbath day worship that um, I have friends and siblings who have little kids, and sometimes the Sabbath does not feel like a delight. It's what am I going to do with them all day, uh, the energy, those types of things. So I really appreciated the comment that you just made about it, we can be out ministering, we can also be in ministering, even to our own children and taking opportunities. Um, lots of parents are really busy these days, and grandparents, and, and they're busy um doing all good things for their families, right? You're, we're working a lot, we're, we're running them around to athletics events, all kinds of things. Um, and so sometimes what we forget is the value of just sitting with our children and playing with them and, uh, and taking walks with them and just en enjoying their energy, which is really hard because parents are usually really tired on Sunday. Uh, as well. And I think, so if I'm, if I'm honest about this battle, like I, I get the struggle of <laughs> it being that. Um, so one of the verses that's really helped me is actually a cross-reference to Exodus 31. Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Again, the Savior's all over in the Old Testament, and I love it so much. But this idea, President Nelson focuses heavily on what sign do you want to give to the Lord? And uh, that's, I think, a great question. And maybe you've established some things. Maybe you tried some things back when there was a, a big focus by the church of and all the brethren of saying, seek to make the Sabbath more meaningful. Um, but maybe there's some things that we need to remember around that. So go back to whatever you chose then. You can evaluate with the Lord, what do I need to do now? One of the things that I've loved, if it's a sign between me and you, then going back to even 
Tyler's comment earlier about it's this relationship. So yes, what do I want to give him? But also what does he want to do for me? So if this is a sign that if the Sabbath is a sign of what he wants to do for me, then it shifts my mind of instead of what, what do I need to do to accomplish thy will to him saying, what does he want to give me so that I can accomplish his will? And, and so I love this phrase that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So for many years, and I don't remember when this insight came to me, that's been my question. What on the Sabbath day can I do that will allow the Lord to reveal himself as a sanctifier for me? Because he wants, if he wants to sanctify me, and that's one of his purposes of the Sabbath, then, then what activities would invite that? And now I'm no longer doing it because this is what I think you want me to do. It's I'm inviting sanctification. How will you cleanse me? How will you purify me? How will you make me kinder or more? Like even ministering, again, there is something about meeting needs, but it's also what changes for me. We all know the warm feeling of serving and that changes something in me. I love people more. I see them differently, whatever lesson that is. But um, for me, one of the keys has been the sacrament. I, uh, covenants feel big sometimes. We make them baptism, uh, temple covenants, and they feel really big and out there. What I can do, <laughs> I can live Sunday to Sunday. Some people are paycheck to paycheck. I live sacrament to sacrament in a really holy way. And one of the ways that I know the Lord will reveal himself to me as a sanctifier is to show up on Sunday and take the sacrament. And when I have thought about what the sacrament is, I can't think of a single thing that would be more important for me to do on Sunday than to get to the sacrament table and, and work through my relationship with him, not just in a repentant way, but there's also a line in, um, in uh, the hymn, as, as now we take the sacrament, which changed also my experience. I used to think it was just me uh, dumping all my sins and sorrows at the sacrament table. I'm so sorry. I promised to be better. And sometimes I didn't like feel that good about it, except for I knew I needed to be there. But in, in the hymn, as now we take the sacrament, um, there's a line from him that says um, in verse one, our thoughts are turned to thee, thou son of God who lived for us and died on Calvary. Calvary. We contemplate thy lasting grace, thy boundless charity. And as I have sat or prepared for the sacrament on Sunday, I have contemplated how he has showed me grace this week and what charity is demonstrated in my behalf. And every time I see things that I didn't see during the week, and every time I see him as a sanctifier. And our relationship has been so beautiful and healing as I've just, if all you can do is make it to the sacrament table in, your, in this progress of getting from worldly to godly, that is going to be a beautiful way to honor his Sabbath. And, uh, and anyway, I just love that idea. That's my, that's my question. You come up with your own. But what, what can I do that will allow him to reveal him? He has revealed himself as a sanctifier through my family. As I've sat with him, as I've played with uh, my nieces and nephews, as I've sat with, anyway, he just, I have seen him in so many elements. Instead of the list of do's and don'ts that sometimes fills whatever to us, that's, that's the way. He wants to show me. And, uh, and he has shown me. And I'm so excited for all he's going to show me with all the life I have left. This concludes part one of this week's episodes. Please watch part two to continue with the discussion. The link will be in the description below, as well as included on the end screen. Thanks for watching and know that you're loved.